A lot of you, many of you have already been baptized. You come in. We're just we're having the final message. Okay. And come, come on in. And eat your McDonald's. We're eating nachos, so yeah. we're good. Mm. Okay. Uh, but I just want to say, teenagers, that I believe that I believe that we have a bright future in our country because God's working in our young people. And I don't think it's just here. I think it's a lot of places. But I know it's here. I know God's speaking to your hearts. And don't you stop being tender-hearted. Don't you stop listening to what God's saying to you. And, uh, you know, all the things that we have in our society that are going on, all the people that are hurting, all the pain, all the hardship, you follow the Lord Jesus and you don't have to go through those things. You don't have to go through those things. You follow Jesus and you can point other people to the cross. There's always victory in Jesus Christ. And so I'm excited about you. I look forward to, I want to mention to you that we're planning on having Teen Sunday School this coming Sunday morning. We're going to have a class just for teens. And we're going to start an Issues Sunday School class. So the class goes like this. We got issues. The Bible has answers. So we're going to start talking about teen issues this Sunday morning. At least we begin this Sunday. Brother Taj will be there. I'll be there. And uh, we'll be uh, heading up that class. And so I want to let you know about that. To qualify to go to the class, you have to be going into 7th grade or uh, be 13 years old or be real sneaky and trick me somehow. But it probably won't work. And you probably won't want to because if you don't qualify to go to the class, you qualify to go to Mrs. Price's class. And that's, let's just be honest about it. How many of y'all think Mrs. Price's class is the best class in the church? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's the deal. So, uh, you all have a great time in my class, but uh, you can come to her class if, you, if you're not quite old enough to go to my class. Okay, so that's going to be an issue Sunday school class. Why? Because we got issues. And the Bible has answers. And so make sure to invite your family. Our class, uh, we got a Bell Sunday School class, we got a Kids Sunday School class, we got a Teen Sunday School class, and that's a Sunday morning. Now, have you found John chapter 1? All right. I want to read, and I began to say just a moment ago, that sometimes the Bible gives express commands. Like, for instance, in the Old Testament, we have uh, the commandments, right? There's more than just the Ten Commandments, but we have the Ten Commandments, don't we? Uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, 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 honor thy father and thy mother. Uh, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. We have the Ten Commandments, things that you're commanded to do or to not do. Uh, in the New Testament, a lot of times, like I said, Jesus says things like, uh, a new commandment I give unto thee, that you love one another. And Jesus said, if you love one another, the whole world's going to know that you're my disciples. That's a, that's a sign that you love Lord Jesus. And teenagers, I want to just tell you something. Sometimes, you know this, sometimes teenagers can be cruel. Sometimes they can be mean. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can be awful. But teenagers that love Jesus ought to act like that. If there ever ought to be a place that you can come and you know, I don't have to be like anybody else, but this is my family and these people love me, it ought to be a church youth group. And uh, we ought to be committed to love people. Because Jesus said, if you want to be known as my disciples, you love one another. You know, love doesn't need anything. Love doesn't require anything. A person who loves can just love someone. You may see someone in youth group or someone in your school that you're inviting to youth group, and you may think, you know that person, uh, they, don't, they don't love me. You don't know what's going on in somebody's life. You just need to love people. And you don't need to be treated well to love somebody. And uh, it's what Jesus wants for our youth group to love each other. So the Bible gives some commandments, doesn't it? But other times in the Bible, there are things that you see that are done, and you look at the results of what happened, and you realize, based on what happened, that this is a good thing. Jesus doesn't say, do this, necessarily, in that place, although what we're going to look at this evening, we are commanded to do. But just because it's not expressly commanded, we can also see things in the Bible that are for an example for us. And so I want to use some of those things. I want to look at some of those things uh, this evening. And uh, I want to begin looking at verse 35. The Bible says again the next day after John, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh... Or I'm sorry, I'm, I'm quoting, and it's, that's a different gospel. It says it that way. Verse 37, And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following. He said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He said unto them, Come and see. 
They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonas, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Verse 43, The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael saith unto him, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. It's an interesting play on words and truth. Verse 48, Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when I was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, Thou art the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said, Because I said unto thee, I saw the end of the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. We can go on looking at more. Matter of fact, this entire gospel shows us similar things to what we're going to look at this evening. I want to pray and ask the Lord's help now. We'll look at a couple simple truths, and then we'll finish up our week. Father? Thank you for the truth that's in the Scripture. I pray that this evening as we look at individuals who followed you and who pointed others to you, that we would see a model to live by. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you were to read the beginning part of John here, you would see an introduction to a man whose name was John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was a person, uh, according to verse 20 of chapter 1, he confessed and denied not and said, I am not uh, the Christ. John the Baptist was called to say, Behold the Lamb of God. He was called, he was the person who was set, the one who was to say, the person who is prophesied who is going to be the Savior of the world, he's here. Uh, the kingdom is here. Jesus Christ is, is come. The Messiah is in our lifetime and he's here on this earth. John the Baptist actually baptized disciples and they were just baptized into what was called the baptism of John the Baptist, that is that they believed the prophecy of the Scripture that said that Christ was born, that Christ was come, even though they didn't know yet who He was, but that they believed in the Messiah, believed in the Christ, even though they were not personally introduced to Him. I want us to look at verse, um, verse uh, uh, 32. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it bowed on Him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. John had prophesied that Jesus was going to come and that God, God had told John, God's Spirit had told John the Baptist, that the person that you see God's Spirit descend on, that's the one that you're prophesying about. And John here is testifying, saying, I saw God's Spirit descend from heaven and rest on Jesus. This is the one that I told you about. And here in our text this evening, we see by example, one who testifies and says, this is the one I'm telling you about. Teenagers, I would urge you to assume the role of being John the Baptist. You know Jesus is God, but what a wonderful message from the Bible this evening where Jesus told us who He is, and you know it's true. You've received the witness in yourself. God's Spirit is in you saying, Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of God. So what do you do about it? What do you do about it? Well, you tell people Jesus is God. Jesus is God. You know something? There are people who are bent or persuaded of things. And the truth of the matter is that facts have nothing to do with what they believe. You ever met somebody who facts had nothing to do with it? You ever had somebody who thought you did something you didn't do? Don't say your parents. But people make mistakes sometimes, don't they? You ever had somebody, they, I mean, they honestly thought you did something, but you really didn't do it? And you finally realize after trying to explain 
that there was no use explaining because they wanted to believe that you get it, you didn't. They just wanted to believe it. They wanted to believe something about you, they just believe it. And facts have nothing to do with it. And uh, here's a worse question. You ever been somebody that was just, just flat wrong about something? And you didn't want to hear what anyone had to say because you just believed it? And you wanted to believe it, you did? And I feel stupid when that's me, but it's happened to me before. I'll tell you, some of the worst experiences I've ever had in the ministry is thinking that teenagers had done something wrong, and I found out later they weren't the ones that did it. Oh, you talk about feeling awful. You, I was just thinking that somebody did something wrong. And, you know, it just looked like all the evidence pointed to it. There were witnesses that lied about people. I remember one time somebody lied about somebody. And I believed the people. They, they were credible, the people that lied about someone. But I remember a particular young man in tears, and my saying to him, you know, I, I want to believe you, but I have so many people that tell me a different story than what you're telling me. I can't believe you. I found out years later those people were lying and he was telling the truth. And I remember, I can, I can just vividly see the, the, that young man in tears. He was an 18-year-old young man, and he was accused of doing something. And I had to investigate it, and I just said, you know, I wish I could believe you, but I can't. And you know something, I was wrong about that. Oh, what a terrible feeling. Well, you know there's people that, for whatever reason, have a bent or a persuasion about Jesus. And they're wrong about it. But I want to tell you something that no one, that no one can argue about, no one can argue against, is that you've had a real experience and you've really met God. The Bible says, He that believeth hath witness in himself. That's God's Spirit in you. <coughs> You ever hear the Word of God preached and literally felt that it was true? That's God's Spirit speaking in you. That's God's witness in you. And when you know that, that's just something where somebody can say, well, you know, all the evidence proves that, that there's no God. Well, first of all, all the evidence doesn't prove that there's no God. But you know, that person is really not interested in evidence. They're actually just believing what they want to believe and they are believing the evidence they want to hear. And truth has nothing to do with it, but you know what they can do nothing about? The witness in you. I remember one time, I was sitting between a Muslim man and a Jewish lady in a cell phone office, an AT&T cell phone office, so you know I was there for hours. And so I was at AT&T sitting in a cell phone office, had a Jewish lady on my right hand and a Muslim man on my left, and we struck up friendly conversation. And... We were just talking about probably how terrible AT&T was, I suppose. I think, you know, the hundred people sitting there in line were probably doing that. I don't know. Maybe that's what we were discussing. But finally, the lady said to me, she said, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm an assistant pastor at a church here in town. She said, oh, that's interesting. And uh, I said, well, what do you do? And she said, well, I sell Judaica. I sell Jewish artifacts, kind of religious Jewish symbol type of things. I said, well, that's really interesting. And, and we started having a conversation. She started talking to me about being Jewish, and I started asking her some questions. I asked her a, a couple honest questions that I had that I, I just wondered if she knew the answer to. I asked her, for instance, I said, you know, when I read the Old Testament, it seems pretty clear that Jews are supposed to have a high priest from the tribe of Levi, and that they are supposed to offer sacrifices at least once a year and that they're supposed to worship God a certain way that I don't see happening anywhere in the world. And I just wonder, you know, I wonder what, why that is. I wonder if you could answer that. And so she started telling me, well, you know, I had a husband who was, was uh, you know, she told me the religion, it was an offshoot of Christianity that he was a part of. And uh, she said, you know, we had a lot of common ground. She said, I believe, I've always believed that, you know, I don't necessarily need to offer a sacrifice, but that I can just go to God, directly to God. I said, well, I believe something similar. I believe that Jesus Christ is my sacrifice, and He's the way to go to God. We were having a good conversation, and then the man on my left side said, well, and he jumped in. He was Muslim. And so he started telling me what Muslims believed. Muslims believed. And uh, it was a friendly conversation, and we were going on pretty soon. I looked around, and I noticed everybody in the room was listening to our conversation. It just got completely quiet in there. And um, I realized after a while, the lady was going to believe what she wanted to believe. I believed what I believed. And the man honestly believed what he believed. All three of us were very devout. And it occurred to me something that I said to them. I said, you know, it's really interesting. I said, 
you, I said to the man on the left, I said, you believe that you're right. And I said, if you're right, then I can't possibly be right and neither can she. And I said to her, I said, you believe that you're right. And if you're right, then I can't possibly be right and neither can he. And I said, I believe that I'm right. And if I'm right, neither of you can be right. And I happen to know that I'm actually right. And I said, that sounds kind of arrogant, doesn't it? And everybody there said yes. And I said, I, the difference between what you believe and what I believe, I said, each of us, beginning with the premise we begin with, I believe the Bible is the Word of God, and based on what I believe, I know I'm right. I said, you believe what you believe, and you believe what you believe, and I restated what you each of them and said they believe. I said, we all believe are right. I said, but the difference between you and me is that I have God's Spirit living in me, witnessing that what I believe is right. And I said, I don't believe either of you honestly can say that you have that. And you know something they were honest enough to say, well, you know, I can't say that. I can't say that I have that. And you know something? Folks, that's an indisputable proof that there's a God, is God's Spirit living in you. Now there are times that you could grieve the Spirit of God. There are times that you could quench the Spirit of God. And you wouldn't feel like God's there. But listen, don't... Don't doubt in the darkness what you knew in the light. And when you went through a time and you realized God's real and He's speaking to me and I know it, always remember that and always go back to that. Always return to that truth. Okay? Okay, so here we see John. And John said, first of all, he said, I told you that the person that descended from heaven and I saw the Holy Spirit, or the person that the Holy Spirit descended on, that's Him. And I want you to see what happened when John said that. The Bible says in verse 35, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the Bible says in verse 37, the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Now, I can tell you that in places in the Scripture it's expressly commanded that Jesus said, Follow me. But I like these individuals when they saw that's God. That's the Messiah. That's Jesus. When they saw that, they said, see you, John. Was John the Baptist a bad guy? No. Uh, in another place in the Scripture, the Bible says that some of John's disciples came and told him that the person whom he pointed out, the one he baptized, Jesus, he said, he's making more disciples than you are. And John said, the servant isn't greater than his master. He said, I was, <laughs> I'm just come to preach Christ and who He is. Folks, I want to tell you something. When you find out who Jesus is, just follow Him. Yeah. When you get to know who Jesus is, just follow Him. Now, when you follow Him, you might be right behind men that, that Jesus has told to follow Him. You might be with a John the Baptist, and Jesus might have told you that. And as long as they're following Jesus, you just you follow right along with them. You know, God appointed in the church certain people to follow, didn't He? Mm -hmm. He gave us pastors in churches. And pastors are, are a, a type of authority in the church. And you ought to follow a pastor, but you, you follow a pastor because you're following Jesus. That's why. You're following Jesus. And John's disciples, they saw Jesus, and the Bible says, see you, John. did say it that way, but they just left and followed Him. They said, where are you going, Jesus? And He said, come and see. They went and saw the place where He dwelt. Uh, the Bible says in uh, verse 30, uh, verse, I'm sorry, 40, the Bible says, one of the two which heard John speak and followed Him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. He brought him to Jesus. Now, teenagers, I would love to have an Andrew Fellowship in our church. I'd love to have an Andrew Fellowship in our church. You know, if you had the reputation of, I found Jesus, come and see. Come and see. Listen, I'm going to just tell you something. You and I know a lot of people that would not be good candidates to be Christians, don't we? I mean, you say, that person, that, they'll never be a good Christian. But I just want, want you to think about something. Neither would you be if somebody described you. That's right. Well, you know what happened? You saw Jesus. And that changed things, didn't it? When you saw who Jesus was, people would say, oh, that person, nah, he'll never be a believer. That person never followed Jesus. But when you saw Jesus, you didn't care about that anymore. You just said, that's Jesus, I'm a follower. And when Andrew found out that that was Jesus, he said, i got to tell my brother. I had one of the teenagers 
uh, this week, Noah told me. Noah, he, he said, you know, he said, I called, I called my friend. I, I talked to her the same night that I got saved. I let her know. Let her know about what happened to me. You know, that's an Andrew. I found Jesus. I know who Jesus is. I want to tell you. Teenagers, you, uh, you want to tell your brothers. You want to tell your sisters. You want to tell your moms. You want to tell your dads. And you say, well, well you know, I don't really think that, that you know, they're into religion. I don't think they like church. I don't think they're whatever. Well, you find out what happens when you tell them you know Jesus. <laughs> you get to know Simon Peter a little bit. I can just imagine. You can imagine how Simon would have been described before he started following Jesus. But you know something? Andrew, Andrew brought Simon. He said, Q, come, come see. Come see. I know Jesus. God, give us some Andrews. You know, Sunday morning, if you bring a lost person to my Sunday school class and you bring them to church, I'll preach the gospel to them. I'll make sure they hear about Jesus. You tell them, come and see. God's working in our church. God's working in my life. We met Jesus. It's the real thing. It's the real deal. It's not religion. God's doing something. Come see. Good example, isn't it? First example, they just said, oh, I'm following Jesus. There he is. They just left. John, I'll follow you. Where are you going, Jesus? I'm going. And then they said, we found him. Come and see. The Bible says in uh, verse 42 about Simon, it brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, the, uh, which is by interpretation stone. And it's a play on, on the words that were the meaning of his name. Verse 43, the Bible says, The following day Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. And the Bible says in verse 45, I want you to notice this, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Do you guys see a pattern here? In other words, where did Jesus' disciples come from? Well, there were a couple of devout men who believed in Jesus and they were following John the Baptist who was preaching that the person that God tells me, he's, the, he's going to be the Messiah, the one that I see the Holy Spirit descending on. And John the Baptist told the truth and he confessed and denied not. He said, I'm not the Christ, but he said, that's him. That's him. And his disciples said, okay, we're following. And they went and told their brother and their brother said, I'll follow. And they went and told and they went and told and they went and told. And you heard the gospel today because of people who went and told. And I want to urge you teenagers to be Nathaniels. To be the kind of individuals, I'm sorry to be not Nathaniels, but Andrews. The kind of individuals that find your brother and tell about Jesus. Every one of us knows someone who doesn't know, don't we? Sometimes we're afraid. You ever had somebody laughed at you because of important things? You know why people laugh at someone sometimes when they want to talk about Jesus? I'll tell you why, because they're uncomfortable. It brings them conviction. Uh, it's because it's, sometimes it's something that they're afraid to talk about themselves, and so they just try to just laugh in order to not be serious about it. Sometimes that's the way people respond to serious matters. And you think that they're making fun, but actually kind of interested and they just don't know how to react, how to respond. Does it matter how someone responds? If you love them, what are you going to do? Tell them. You're going to tell them. You're going to be an Andrew. Let's have an Andrew fellowship in our youth group, shall we? All right. Let's pray and let's thank God for what he's done this week. And then we'll have Mr. Taj come and he's going to finish out our awards time. We're going to find out how everything shakes out. God, thank you for teenagers that have found the truth. Thank you for a place that's a haven for the preaching of God's Word. And I pray that that will continue to grow in our youth group. God, give us, give us young people that have a boldness and that have a love and that God, they just follow you and that they just tell other people that they found you to come and see. I thank you for it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Mr. Tom! That actually really scared me. All right. <laughs>